Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin in the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, though my, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like those, like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle. They will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. Psalm 32. Have you ever had or tried to hide something? Every Christmas, after their grandchildren, no matter what age, and now we're all in their 20s, have opened their presents, we live, give them a little gift of sweets. And every year we hide a little gift of money and watch to see if they can find it. Where every year... They do. Sometimes we've caught them out nearly, but last year in particular we nearly caught them. And I say they're all in the 20s, but we still had them. We had some little smarties. And I always said, this is nice, opening it, expecting to find the money, but no, there was just smarties. Until, I'm not sure it was Laura or Emma, suddenly discovered that if you tip them out halfway down the packet was the little, little bit of money. Well, it's not coins these days, that's be notes, isn't it? Uh, that was hidden there. We can never successfully hide it from them. They'll find it, no matter what you do with it. Have you ever tried to hide something from God? Well, all I can say is you will never, ever succeed. Just like the children with those sweets and the money hidden in there, every single Christmas they find it. And more so God. We can never hide from God. And one of the th main things we do seek to hide, of course, is our sins. When we do something wrong, we're a bit like Adam and Eve, we naturally try and hide it. We don't want God to see it. We don't want God to discover it. But the truth of the matter is, no. We can never hide it from God. Because we know that God is all-seeing, all-knowing, and he knows everything about us. He knows every action, every thought, every deed. Nothing's hidden from God. And uh, the psalmist discovered that, of course, in this psalm, and in other psalms as well. Psalm 32 is one of the seven penitential psalms, of course. Psalm 6, 38, 51, 102, 130, and 143 are all psalms of penitence. It was Martin Luther who called Psalm 32 one of the Pauline psalms because Paul quotes in Romans 4, 7, and 8 the first two verses of Psalm 32. And he does so, of course, to make it a pivotal point in his argument about salvation by faith and by faith alone. So this psalm, as well as many others, records the experience that David went through when he had to face up to the consequence and the guilt of his sins. And he knew what it was to confess them, and he knew it was to receive God's forgiveness, of course. So the psalm begins talking about the blessings you experience when God covers your sin. And then he goes on to talk about the burdens you bear when you try and cover it yourself and hide it. And then finally, he talks about the benefits you receive when you trust God and hand it all over to him. 
But verses 1 and 2, he starts with this tremendous statement that the blessings you experience when God covers your sin. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, whose spirit is no deceit. What a wonderful position to be in. To know God's forgiveness, to know God's gracious hand upon us. It's a tremendous privilege, says the psalmist, says David. This is the blessedness of those who seek to know God dealing with their sins. God covering their sins. Blessed, of course, means a state of happiness or happy, ongoing experience. And he describes this blessedness and this happiness in, in two ways, actually. First of all, he's blessed and he knows a state of happiness because God has covered his sins and there's now a clean record. Slate is wiped clean. Now, all of us make mistakes in our Christian lives, sometimes big mistakes, sometimes massive errors of judgment. And it can weigh us down. It can hold us back. And sometimes it's hard to come to terms with the sin in our lives or some of the actions that we take and do. And we need, of course, at times, a, a fresh start, a, a cleaning of the slate, in a sense. To seek to begin all over again with our walk with the Lord. To wipe the slate clean. Well, Psalmist says, God can do that. God can forgive us. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. The sins are covered. God wipes the slate clean. Now, the word forgiven, literally, I'm given to understand, means lifted up and carried away. Forgiven. Taken and cast away. It's as though God picks up that sin and carries them as far away as possible. And the word covered, of course, means, literally means hidden from sight. Not to be seen anymore. We can see our sins taken away and blotted out. Blessed is the one whose sins have been covered, who've been blotted out, who've been taken away, cast away. How is this possible? Well, of course, it's all because of Christ. It's all because of Jesus took our sins on the cross. Sins now, sins to come, sins in the future. We're told we have redemption through his blood. So faith in Christ and trust in Christ and being covered by God's love can make us clean. Give us a clean record. So God covers our sins. He gives us a clean record and ongoing as well. But the second thing we notice here, of course, in verse 2, blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, whose spirit is no deceit. Because not only does he give us a clean record, he gives us a clean heart. God says, I don't bring any charge against you. You're forgiven, you're free, you're clean. And sometimes that's... Hard to understand, but we need to take it on board. Thelma won't mind me mention this, but Dave Britton, a man I greatly admired, he once said this to me. You know, Dennis, what God has forgiven, we've forgotten. What God has forgiven, we've forgotten. And that's the same with God. When God forgives it, he casts it away. And so must we. If God cleanses, covers our sins then there's no use picking them up again and going over and over and over again. They're gone. And that's the same in our dealings with one another, you know. We all sin at times. But if we can all it is, know the blessedness of God coming and covering our sins, we have no charge against them because God hasn't got any charge, neither should we. So God gives us a clean slate. He gives us a clean heart. 
But the second thing we notice here, not only does we have the blessings we experience when God covers our sins, when he forgives our sins, gives us a clean start, a fresh start, a clean heart. But in verse 3 to 5, he's very human here. He speaks of the burdens we bear when we try and cover them ourselves. David speaks about the burdens that come upon us because we try and deal with ourselves. He gets very personal. And he shares his experience of trying to cover up himself. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Though my groaning all day long, day and night your hand was heavy upon me. What a position. We've all been in that, haven't we? Trying to deal with it ourselves. First of all, verse 3, the waste of silence. David was carrying around the burden and trying to cover up himself, his sin, without taking it to God. Now, there's several reasons why we hold back. Why we hold back our sins and try and deal with it ourselves instead of bringing it to God for him to cover. There's several reasons. One is pride. We don't want to admit that we've done wrong. We don't want to admit that we failed. We also withhold because of the sense of despair. We may be so overwhelmed by the sin that we've come that we are dealing with. And the sense of guilt. We don't possibly believe that God can do anything. God will never forgive me for doing that. Either way, what we're talking of here. David was on no speaking terms with God. I kept silent. What a sad place to be. And perhaps we've been at that place. We've kept silent. As far as God is concerned, we didn't want to share it. We didn't want to bring it to him. We didn't really believe that he could do anything. We had so much guilt. And, and God is there. And we're silent. Sad state for David to be in, but perhaps we've all experienced that over the years. Silent with God. Not talking to him about it at all. When we've held out against God, refused to admit that we've done wrong, and despaired that we could ever get God's forgiveness. That's what he's talking about here. And he says, of course... What a waste of time it is. My bones wasted away. What a waste of time it is to try and deal with yourself instead of bringing the guilt and the sin to God. But then he says, Your hand night and day was heavy on me. My strength was sapped and as the summer, heat in summer. Your heavy hand was upon him. God convicts us of sin, and when we refuse to deal with it, he continues to discipline us. We talk about his heavy hand upon us, wanting us to confess, wanting us to come to him, and time and again he lays his hand upon us. David realizes this. He's kept silent. He's tried to deal with it himself, but all the time he knows that God's hand is upon him. Convicting him. He knew he was wrong. He knew he had to come clean. But he was refusing to deal with it. But God was always there. And God loves us so much. If we're a believer this morning, he wants to love us so much that he does not want us to continue in sin. And he won't. He won't let us. And if we refuse to confess and deal with our sins, the heavier his hand comes upon us. The heavier we feel the weight of God's hand. He convicts us by his spirit. He reminds us of his love. He disciplines us to draw us back to a place with himself so that we acknowledge and confess and know his presence again. To come back to me speaking terms with God. 
And if we respond, of course, like David, we will know the great joy of coming to him. We continue to resist, we'll never know the joy. We, like David, will become more and more miserable. More and more out of tune with God. But then, in verse 5, we see the wonder of confession. What does he say? Then... After all this, then I acknowledged my sin and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgive the guilt of my sin. He came to a point at the end of himself. Couldn't deal with it anymore. Couldn't cope with it. God's conviction was upon him. His spirit was seeking to lead him and guide him and bring him to a point of acknowledgement of his sin. And he finally does it. God finally breaks through. Have you experienced that over the years? Many a time you've held out because you know you've done wrong, sin, you've displeased him, you, you've stopped talking to him, but he doesn't give up. If we're a believer, he doesn't give up. His spirit continues to come and come and come till eventually then I acknowledge my sin. What a place to be here. Then. I can't do it myself. I can't make myself right. I can't cover my sin. I need God. That's what David said. I acknowledge that I need God here. I need God to know the blessing of verses 1 and 2. I can't do it myself. He convicts us, he reminds of his love, he disciplines us, draws us back. And then the confession. David comes to the breaking point. He finally opens up. He finally breaks down and confesses his sin to God. And then we see something of the relief. Oh, the relief, the forgiveness that God can bring. The sweet relief of God's forgiveness. Why do we hide? I once heard a story of a contractor who was visiting the company to make a bid for a certain project. And the executive he was speaking to excused himself, said he had to deal with someone in the other room. The contractor noticed the desk. There was the competitor's price. But there was a tin over the top of it. So he couldn't resist. <laughs> he moved, lifted the tin but there was no bottom and thousands of little beads fell all over the table and all over the floor. The executive came in and sent him away. It was revealed. We can't hide anything from God. We can't cover up against him. He will always say, he will always reveal, no matter how clever we think we are. We can never cover our sins, no matter how hard or clever we think we are. Proverbs says, he who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces finds mercy, finds forgiveness. So David, yes, he says, blessed when our sins of, trans of transgression are forgiven. But oh, when we keep silent, when we try and deal with ourselves, we know nothing but misery, hardship, heartache. Until we come to that point of trusting God and handing it back over to him. David had committed some terrible sins. David was guilty of awful things. And he knew that. But he tried to cover them. He tried to hide them from God until, of course, he came to the end of his misery and acknowledged that only God can deal with it. And he confessed to him. That's a wonderful position of being a believer. But what if you're not a believer this morning? What if you don't know what it is to know that walk with God? To know that trust and faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, you know, you'll never be joyful and truly happy 
until you know that forgiveness that God alone can bring. So many people seek to live lives, many religious lives, good lives, but they'll never come up to God's standard. Till we come to that point of acknowledging that we are sinners and we need Christ. And when we come to that point, God comes flooding in and brings us into a position, what we call salvation, of trust and faith in him. So what have we seen so far? The blessings we experience when God covers our sins, deals with our sin. The burdens and the misery that we have to bear when we try and cover it ourselves. And then thirdly, the benefits we receive when we take cover in God. That's verses 6 to 11. The benefits we receive. And I see two benefits here when we take cover. Uh, God at his word and know him covered in our sins. Two benefits I see here. First of all, his protective care and then his unfailing love. His protective care and his unfailing love. First of all, his protective care, verse 67. Therefore let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rise of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. You will protect me, says David. I have come to that point in my life when I need to put everything into your hands. I need to trust you, confess my sins, just trust you know your mercy, your forgiveness, and now your protection. Because you see, David was still prone to sin. Of course he was. He could still sin and still did sin. But he wanted to know God's protection. To help him cope with the problems and difficulties and sin life that came upon him. So he moves from his testimony to his exhortation. He's just shared how he finally comes to confess his sin to God, know God's blessing. He exhorts us to do the same. But notice it's directed towards the faithful. Who's the faithful here? Well, God's people. The faithful of God's people, where it can be the saints. If you're a believer this morning, God's protection is there for you. As you struggle and fight against the enemy, against Satan, against the sin that so easily comes into your life, we pray for his protection. The Hebrew words, I believe, just mean saints, the holy ones, the people who belong to God, the faithful who confess to God and know his forgiveness, they want, we want to know his protection. Because we're so easily led astray. We so easily fall into sin again. We sin, we know he's, com can we confess, we know his forgiveness, but we want him to protect us, to try and keep us from doing the same things over and over again to displease him. Now there's an interesting phrase there, isn't it? while you may be found. Now I think this is a very simple exhortation to pray now rather than later. Don't put it off. Seek God's love and protection now, daily. Wake up in the mornings, you go through the day and the evening, Lord, keep me, keep me, protect me, watch over me. None of us can claim tomorrow. And if we feel conviction of sin, we need to confess it daily. I need to know his mercy daily. We need to know his protection daily. Know his experience daily. You see, when we call out in faith to God, not only will God cover our sins, but God will cover us through his Son, that protective care in this life and then for eternity. So we're surrounded by his care and protection, but we're also surrounded in verses 8 to 11 by his love, his protective care and his love, of course. His loving eye upon us. That's a wonderful expression in God's loving eye upon us. He sees us. He knows us. 
If we're a believer this morning, we are loved by him. And he's not only wanting to protect us, he wants us to know continually his love upon us. To share and experience his love. And that warmth that it brings. That assurance it brings. When we know continually the love of God coming over us. Surrounding us. And when we make God our hiding place, we read here, we have that unfailing love. God will never fail in his love for us. We might fail time and time again. But what David is saying here, may I know his love continually. He will go on sinning, will David? Of course he will. But he wants God to protect him, protect him and help him fight off these temptations, these sins that so easily beset him. And on top of that, he wants to know God's love. If you love somebody, you protect them, don't you? That's God. He loves us so much, he wants the best for us. He wants to protect us. He wants us to keep us in a close walk with him. Not in verses 2 to 4, wasting away and groaning and moaning and feeling that we're nowhere when all the time, says David, we can know his presence. We can know his love. We can know that daily walk with him that will fill us with joy and a real sense of purpose. God says, I will instruct you. I will teach you. In the way you should go there in verse 8. I will be there. I'll teach you. I'll lead you. I'll guide you. I'll show you the way. I'll watch over you. What a promise. What a difference from verses 2 to 4 when he sat there miserable. Now because he's acknowledged his sin and wants God to cover him, all of a sudden he says, God says, I'll be with you. Don't deal with this by yourself. Don't fight it. Trust me. Trust me to protect you and trust me as you experience my love daily. Only God can enable us to live a full and fruitful life. Can't do it ourselves. Only God can. And God says, I'm not going to lead you like somebody leading a mule or a horse with a bridle and a bit and you pull the mouth so the horse has to follow. I'm not going to lead you like that, he says. I'm going to leave you in love. I'm not going to beat you with a whip and drive you on, says God. That's not my way. I will lead you in love and protection. Trust me, he says. Soften your heart. Be quick to confess. Ready to repent. Ready to return. And you'll know my love and protection. Why do we, why do we not trust that? Then, of course, what's the conclusion of all this? Verse 11. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad you're righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. The Lord's unfailing love surrounds us so that we might rejoice in him. Are you rejoicing in God this morning? Or is there some problem, some sin that you're trying to deal with and battle with? Bring it to God. Let him cover it. Let him deal with it. If you're a believer in Christ this morning, he willingly will take that and cast it away. Surround you with his love. Lead you, guide you, teach you, instruct you. Not slavishly, but in love. David comes in full circle. From the first two verses to verse 11. Full circle. When God covers our sin through Christ, and we acknowledge that, respond to it, 
there's the blessings of a clean heart, a clean record. When we try and cover our sins, you experience the wasteful silence of weariness of guilt. Turn to God in repentance and sorrow, surrounded by his care and his love. And as believers this morning, we must trust to learn the lesson. The blessing and his forgiveness is only found in God, in Christ. So I have a question for you this morning. Who are you trusting? Who are you trusting? Who are you trusting to lead you and guide you? Who are you trusting to help you? Who are you trusting to know God's comfort and presence? Not in religion or church attendance, anything like that. It's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came and said, I have come that you might have life. And life to the full, if you trust me and accept me. If you're not a believer this morning, maybe you need to ask yourself, have I ever turned to God and said, God, forgive me for my sin, my waywardness, the fact that I don't know you really, I don't know your love. I don't know your protection. I don't know what it is to walk with you day by day. But I want to. I want to know what it is to walk with you day by day and walk right into heaven when that time comes. But you can only know that through Christ. Jesus came to deal with our sin. Jesus came to blot them out, to cast them away. We can't do it ourselves. We, no matter how many we try, we cannot live a good life in God's eyes. Might live a good life in the eyes of others. You see statues all over different towns and places. That was a good man. Did he trust Jesus? It won't get him to heaven, no matter how many millions he poured into the economy or to good causes or whatever. The only way we will get into heaven is to simply ask Christ to be our saviour and our Lord. We can't do it ourselves. We need God. And the only way God can come is when we trust Jesus to forgive us, to cleanse us, to accept us, and then God's love comes flooding in. There's nothing like it. Nothing like the experience of salvation all the time, all your life, you've been trying to deal with life, dealing with problems. All of a sudden, you yield to God and say, God, I can't do it on my own. You must do it. And you confess your sin, and all of a sudden, like a wave, his love comes pouring over you. You can only experience that when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do experience it, you'll turn around and say, why have I wasted so much time? Why? You can know it. You can know God's unfailing love. You can know his protection. You can know that you have an inheritance. You can know you have a place in heaven when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's an experience that goes beyond any other experience you will ever experience in life. You trust in your own ability to get to heaven. You'll only get it through Christ. We confess our sin, seek his forgiveness. And as believers this morning, as we seek to live on that Christian life, we'll not be perfect, but we're covered by God. His protection, his love. What we need to do is keep short accounts. And we need to turn to him continually. Say, Lord, I can't do this on my own. Help me. Help me to trust you. Help me to know you day and day after day. And then, may each and every one of us come to verse 11. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Who's the righteous? The ones that trusted and believed in Jesus. Sing, <coughs> all you who are upright in heart. Is there a joy, of, a joy of a song in your heart? Because you know God and you know his love, his forgiveness. If you see it, Spurgeon, you'll smile at me because I always finish with a C.H. Spurgeon, don't I? C.H. Spurgeon said this, 
there is as much joy in the heart of God when he forgives as there is in the heart of a sinner when he is forgiven. God is, God is as blessed in giving as we are in receiving. When we receive the blessing from God, God is blessed as well. Praise his name.